team ban. <laughs> Vega squadrons turn to ban. Ten seconds remaining. Five seconds remaining. Reserve time. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome. <coughs> hey, welcome everybody to our first and only series of the Dota Pit Day. I'm Toby One. I'm your host for the English live stream, and we're bringing you Vega versus the boys that still suckle at their mother's teat. It is uh, Mama's boys. Let's go straight into our game. You don't want to see me uh, my ugly face up on the screen, uh, and I welcome in the man whose accent always entertains me as well as informs me with the information he says out of his mouth. That is Gansel. Hello, man. What's happening? <laughs> I'm um, not too bad, actually. It's the it's the, the first series that I've crossed since Star Letter, and incidentally, it's also the first series that Vegas Squadron have played since Star Letter. So I know that it'll be their first of Dota Pit too. I'm not. I, I believe that Mama Bo Mama's boys actually already played one series in this tournament. I think yesterday, and they, they actually lost against uh, London Conspiracy. I'm not sure if you cast that. Um, I, didn't, I didn't cast the one yesterday. That was uh, that was Cap. Who was uh, casting that game? But uh, you are correct. You are correct. Uh, Mama's boys are currently at the bottom of the pool, and Vega, as well as Navi, because this is all out of Group B. Group B is what we're doing tonight. So the only game that was played out of this out of this was uh, London Conspiracy versus Mama's boys. But third, NLG, Navi, as well as Vega, are still to play their first series until today for Vega. All right. Well, what I can say, I mean, yeah, Vega fresh from the land where they, they looked, I mean, I think some people think that Vega is a team. I definitely, at the start of that land, I thought like they're underwhelming, their form's gone down, and then they got some big wins, and against Secrets, against Virtus Pro, uh, maybe well against EG, even though they lost 2-0, they had a game where they probably could have beaten EG. Uh, on the other hand, their all-time history against Mama's Boys, they've actually never won a, a series against against Mama's Boys from when they were, they were formed as 4CL. They've played each other three times, twice at the, the game show land and once I think in Dream League. And each time Mama's boys have, have come out on top. And honestly, I think that maybe Vegas goes down to the fact that Vegas Squadron at a certain point became a bit predictable in the way that they play Dota. And Mama's boys are a very intelligent Dota team. I mean, they they have like support players, AK, MMR. <laughs> that, to me, that's like always a telling factor. The Mama's boys also were using like a game you're talking about back at Dream League. That was when EGM was still playing for 4 CNL. Or yeah, just moving over true. to Alliance. That was a very different time when they were part of 4CNL. They, they were coming up with inventive strats, things seemed to be working well, their synergy looked to be really nice, but that this may be the first time that it turns around the Ten other way and Vega take remaining. out the game. Especially when they can go for something which is more of a pocket strat for them. This is remaining. so much damage and so much push power with Drove VS combo. Uh, and the Death Prophet Dazzle, aka Dazzle keeping Death Prophet alive while she goes through an entire ultimate. Uh, the only thing that was really missing from that lineup was having the Oracle instead of the, uh, instead of the Dazzle. Uh, to make it completely impossible to kill the DP. Yeah, it's quite interesting actually. They've got like two different combinations. Because even though DP's range, she's not really going to benefit that much from the draw or the Venge. Because DP's right clicks are really not that significant. She's about the nukes and the ulti. Um, I mean, while you have the draw on the bench, I guess she will actually be right clicking. A lot of the time you see DPs like literally not right click, like rather use it to move around and get into the right position for each of your nukes. But we might we might see some actual attack animations out of Death Prophet in, in team fights this game. Um, draw Ranger, it's Virtus Pro is certainly known for Draw Ranger. I'm not sure if, if Vega have been a draw team, but Vega. I have very little. That you, you might you might want to start pulling up the stats on it, but I I remember Vega actually being part of the crew that did run Dro Ranger, uh, quite frequently. But it was only during a, a small block period where Dro and the whole aura strat with her was being completely exploited. So, yeah, I'm having. A... Yeah, I still want to see how they wrap up their lineup. Like you don't have to go for the five range effect normally when you go for a Dro lineup is tagged on with an initiator, uh, something like a Spirit Breaker, or you have something which has push and control. Uh, they banned out the hero I thought they might have gone for, which was the Brood Mother. Uh, 
Vent but yeah, I'm interested to see who that last battle. one's going to be, because a lot of the offlaners, uh, Beastmaster and Batrider was the focus of Pycat for his second phase ban. So he's definitely trying to cripple that offlane. And now it picks up potentially his offlaner as well. It's not classic hero of Sexy Bambo. Ten seconds remaining. Find what you're looking for. Radiant team oh, sorry, I actually did and I muted my mic and then I forgot to unmute. So I was saying, <laughs> Sand, Sand King's very good against the draw strategy because you want heroes that can get onto the draw. Not just in terms of disabling and bursting it down, but turning off the, the ult. Um, so, so it makes a lot of sense. I did find Vega Squadron in the history of all Dota 2, well, according to Death Dota anyway, have four games of draw and they're three for one. So, pretty good. I mean, it, there's very little doubt in my mind that they can run the hero regardless of how many times they've played it. Uh, on the other hand, they... I remember more games than that. Maybe they played it in one of the games which aren't ticketed. Vega Squad. Uh, it's possible. Because they might have played it in one of like our, like our JD Cups, which I never got on a ticket. I, I mean, it's definitely possible. There's been quite a lot of tournaments that haven't gotten tickets, that so haven't gotten to Death Dota. Yeah. But for, for my mind, at least, if I think of CIS Dota, I think of Draw Range, I always think of Virtus Pro. Like, they yeah, definitely kind of the signature of the Draw. They're the ones that knocked out Team Secret with the Draw Range and TI5. You know, like, they, but at the same time, I've said many times, and I, I don't think it's that difficult to run a Draw lineup. I think it's certainly unusual what they're doing here, having the Draw with the DP. Almost always you see the draw with, with the second damage core, which actually like is more about the right clicks. Like, you know, your Wind Ranger or your Viper or Shadow Fiend even. So it is a different slant on the approach, and Sven's pretty good against them because the Warcry against all that physical damage. Sam King, as I said, very good jumping onto people. And this is kind of where I see this match. This is what I was saying at the start. I think that Vegas Squadron's a stronger team. They're probably even a tier ahead of Mama's Boys. They definitely like as a as a five man unit, like they know each other better, they play better as a team. But Mama's Boys I sort of see having the potential to outthink Vega in the draft and, and maybe beat them as a result of that. Oh, I don't disagree with you with the fact that Mama Boys have a very strong draft against at least the Dro Ranger. My uh, my concern is once you use things like Glimpse Borrow Strike as well as potentially like uh, I'll get to this thought in a little bit later in time when we get to our laning phase. Um but when you start using all your stuns and your and your distance closing abilities, what else will there be? If Dro Ranger gets a good gust, it's another good and, and simple way to disrupt an off lane sand king. The laning phase is fine there. Dazzle just needs to keep his distance. Get enough farm early on and get that lens. He can keep a very large distance. Uh, and the last point which they required was some level of team fight control and more more than anything else, face creation. So you got VS Swap, you got Dazzle Shallow Grave, you're probably giving it over Yule Slipper from the Death Prophet. Um, Dora Ranger's got a Gust. They've got the potential, if they do work as this five man unit you talk about, to really just keep Mama's Boys at bay, and that all has to come from the laning phase. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I feel is awkward about Vegas Draft is like it's very, very strong in terms of like taking particular fights. But I, I'm nervous about the fact that they have a draw draft that's kind of cooldown dependent because the DP and the Void ulti are, are going to be very crucial to their ability to take fights. And normally one of the very big advantages of a, a draw ranger strategy is that you don't depend on big cooldowns because it's just about really high damage right clicks. So I don't know. There's, there's like, I mean, in, on the one hand, you could say that that's creativity out of Vegas Squadron. They've done something new to the draw ranger draft. But on the other hand, I think there's a good reason why draw drafts don't usually depend on the big ulties. And if there's going to be a way for Mamba's Boys to capitalize this game, it'll be exactly, you know, when there isn't a Chrono, when there isn't an Exorcism. So, you know, the funny thing is, like, I always want to keep the, the thoughts of, uh, ooh, I think it was Fear. Like, I cast with Fear, like, we're talking, talking maybe almost a year ago, actually. Uh, and one of the things he always said about the Drow Ranger is that he feels that the Drow Ranger is an aura. And that's basically the hero. There's not there's nothing more to the hero. So if you just yeah. have if you have a Drow Ranger as a support role, and then you had something like a VS who has moved into court roles previously, uh, play that kind of role as a damage dealer, which you get anyway from the Drow Aura, uh, they basically are running four cores. And the Drow just needs to make sure she has a little bit of agility buff up. You can get like treads as well as two Wraith Bands. Uh, if you feel luxurious, you can get yourself a Yasha. Um, and then you still do your tower pushing power by having something like a Mask of Madness on that Dro Ranger. 
you give everything that you're searching for by just having a couple of items and staying alive. So you don't even have to be involved in the fights. It's almost like an ancient apparition in that case, where you just hold back a long way and you still impact the fight. Not with an it is. Class, I mean, just with. I, I completely agree. Like this, this is a hero that's. I, I think the most professional players would tell you that in a draw ranger strategy, she's not the true carry. She's like a. She supports the actual carry usually, and that's why. That's exactly why I find it strange that they have a DP and not a wind ranger, not a viper, not one of those kinds of heroes because. Normally her job is to sit in that jungle, get farm, stay safe, and make someone else, make the Queen of Pain or the the Wind Range or the Viper or someone hit really hard. And it's gonna come down she's to not... timing though. Like, like, you think about it, like, you're running a DP, you want to be able to take down towers early on. Normally with a level 1 exorcism, you can't really achieve that. But when you've got the draw buff up, if no one rotates early to that top lane, they will burn out that tier 1 tower. And the next time Ulti comes up, they go for the mid tower, then the bottom tower, then Roshan. Like, they'll have the damage, and they do a lot of impact early on against a hero, and this is kind of why I wanted to wait into the laning phase, because I knew it would bring up this point. Um, up against a hero like Sven, who has become a lot more of a, uh, of a farmer hero, by going in for this treads and then helm of the dominator build, and then moving around with uh, a high level up in cleave and farming up the camps. I get a feeling that Vega is trying to punish that small window that Mama's Boys is going to need to farm. Yeah, Sven is, Sven is also a, a kind of like there for tankiness. A lot of the time you see him pick these days, it's because there's stuff, there's a lot of physical damage. And so it's going to be, I, I think you make a good point that Sven's have been maxing Cleave a lot more than they used to. But there's a lot of tension in this game because he, he definitely wants to max his Warcry early on. So we might actually just see only one or two points in the in the stun and leave it at that to max both the other skills together. Seema is really trying to zone out Bambo here. He refuses to level anything up, so he doesn't just go directly into Sandstorm, because he doesn't know... Actually, he should know that there's the aura over on Vega. But once that Ghast is up for Pasha, he can't just easily stand in this lane. But he's only got three Tango charges, and he's actually refusing to use one right now, which is kind of surprising. Yeah, on the, on the other side of the map, the creep stacked up, and so Mag managed to get some XP, but it's going to push away, and... After it pushes away, actually, Disrupt is one of the best heroes at, at zoning a uh, Faceless Void. I think when people started picking off lane faces void initially, the value of it was that supports weren't sure how to zone it because you like if you cast a big nuke, you just time walks the damage off. But because disruptor's nuke is that is like in instances, it's much more difficult to deal with that as the faceless void. So I think very soon Mag's gonna stop getting value out of this lane. We so much harder as well for Mag once uh yes uh, get something like glimpse up and running. You want to time walk out the damage, and that's going to come during a, a very specific period of time. Once Glimpse goes yeah. up, you can just be pulled straight back again. You don't have your escape mechanism, and the Tuscar is then able to capitalize on the situation. Uh, you should note the CS in mid lane. No one is currently uh, ripping apart that Invoker. Obviously, he's got the bonus 11 damage, and he's been using Soul Siphon to try and zone out uh, the Invoker as much as he possibly can. We should have talked about this earlier, to be honest, because this is even the old DP when she was weaker. I think it was widely agreed that she was like just a, a, a easy lane against Invoker. Um, Invoker, once he gets some levels, can sometimes make a comeback in this lane. But in the early levels, it's just like completely one-way traffic. It always is, and the hero has been buffed. So it's, it, this is actually what you expect to happen in this lane. It's nothing to do with the players. Like if they both, if they're equal players, the DP should definitely outperform the Invoker at the start. Well, with that creep wave now. Like, she's still, like, maybe 3 CS average ahead uh, of Hook. So it's not it's not brutal as such, but it's still a little bit off. Yep, so and Mag gonna find each other up near the Dire Secret Shop. Nothing's really gonna come of it, it just shows the rotation. And uh, Hook and Yaps are actually both Jordanian, right? And the, the other Jordanian player we know is Miracle, who's definitely made a big impact on the scene, so... Kind of exciting times, you know, these up-and-coming players from, from countries not historically as associated with professional Dota 2. When, when are we going to get uh, the All-Star South African team? Uh, I don't know, That that's not on me. We've got a couple of 6k MMR players who, you know, hot shots who could make it. But I used to play with them actually myself, but I don't do that anymore. I'm, I'm too old, you know. Getting too slow, you've already... You've already made the decision to move to move to casting as a player. I'm like the yeah, yeah I'm the, I with, with I skipped the professional player. I mean, it's in South Africa. I'm very well known as a player, actually. In fact, South African Dota community thinks of me in very much like an old man fear kind of like everyone makes fun of me and calls me old and 
like it, it's actually what happens right yeah um but yeah you see do you see that mag's gone for iron talon and this is like this is what offlane dota has become in this patch like you're either a hero that is really good just like really strong at laning like the dark or whatever and anyway dark seer and Nature's prophet those heroes are good at the lane and they go to the jungle if you're not one of those select hero very often the supports that they're doing their job they force you to buy an iron talon and go to the jungle that's just you, we're gonna see it more and more and more in this patch if Iron Talon, a lot of players have been complaining about Iron Talon as an item, but honestly, if this item didn't get added to the game, offlaners would just like the offlane would be like, there's only three heroes you can pick in this patch. So who, who needs I think it's offlane. The reason why there's complaints is because of what Korra was doing. Oh, uh, you mean because of jungling and it, getting dragons and stuff? It's the yeah. <laughs> that that was that was Korra's where he wanted to be an ancient. Um, but it's just the manipulation of the jungle, which is where most of the complaints, I believe, are actually stemming from. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think those complaints are legitimate. The point I'm making is just that it's actually like a necessary safety net for offlaners because otherwise offlaners in this patch would... It's, this is like such a difficult patch to, to get value in the actual offlane. <laughs> that push I was talking about from Vega, it's already started up. Seema as well as Solo have actually done a really good job of staying away from pasture. It's one of the most frustrating things any Dro Ranger player. Because when you... You know, like you're being, you could be pressured on the top lane, but your supports have to hang in the lane with you. And then the ones that actually just hang in there anyway. So here's the DPS. No ball it up. Uh, a little bit of a gust missed time there by Pasha, but the first blood is still going to go the way of the Dro Ranger. Yeah, you snowball into a hasted hero, they're going to pull you over there once, and <laughs> pretty easy to finish you off there. So quite a late first blood actually, and it's also something that we've seen quite a lot in this patch so far. Uh, surprisingly, especially I think in, in European Dota, from what I've seen, like slow starting games in terms of kills. Bambo didn't think he had the confidence for that. The Sandstorm moved up and gone for uh, the Virus Strike, maybe it's because uh, Tuskar's uh, shards was on cooldown. They could have locked Seema in their Radiant camp, uh, in, their, in their Radiant Secret shop. So, if you look at, we were talking at the start about what Pycat's going to skill, have you actually checked, he's saved four points. He saved four skill points because he hasn't decided yet, am I going to take Warcry and go fight them, or am I going to take Cleave and just farm the jungle? Yeah. He, he was worried about the same thing I was, the fact that they just forced down too many towers. Now there's a nice little mid gank, but no one, so he just starts uh, just, uh, just taking the souls away from Invoker. The glimpse back, actually not synergizing perfectly. Now the Shallow Grave will kick in from the Dazzle. The Snowball's running forward. No one needs to outrun this. The Snowball doesn't connect. It does actually connect with the first heal. No one may die, but they're going to lose both Disruptor as well as Tuska. His shards drop cool in one second time, so maybe he can block him in, but no. Pasha rotates over. We'll find the pick off with one cold arrow. He's just farming in the jungle. So this leaves yeah, top lane completely unattended, and there's easy CS up there. It looks like Solo's going to take that. It's something I actually appreciate about the C the CIS Strahl players. They almost always have like at least one point in their cold arrows. There's a, there's a, a lot of draw players who actually just completely skip it. And I feel like it's actually fairly common that you get into a situation where just to guarantee a kill, um, you want a little bit of slur. Doesn't make any real sense though to uh, to skip it. I like, it looks like Pycat actually had a crack there at Mag. He's triggered God Strength. Now beaten to the tower before Mag hits his level six. Uh, I mean, the, the, the players who skip it, the, their reasoning is exactly what we discussed earlier. It's like, this hero is meant to just farm in the jungle, be AFK, and give other people damage. That's what they're thinking, but I I, was, I kind of agree with you. I think, like, you know, Dota's a very complicated game, and you're going to get into some situation where you want to be able to slow someone, and then you're going to regret not having it. At the same time, uh, it's one of these things where I don't know the exact movement speed calculations for it, uh, but because they changed Dro Dro Ranger's cold arrows, I think it must have been like three, four major patches ago. Uh, yeah, Mag, you can't TP on towers. Uh, <laughs> no matter how hard you try, but Disrupt still going to go down to Pasha. It's like uh, there was a bit of a dive as well as uh, Tusker dies underneath the tower. Bambo as well as Hook are very low. Two very simple pickoffs there for Vega. Uh, yeah, with, with the level 2 Cold Arrows, they do the same as what level 4 Cold Arrows did. Uh, when that change came, and it allows yeah. you at level 2 Cold Arrows, if you've Preds, 
Yeah. You can just like, you can all walk it. Uh, Barry, get the hell out of there before you get bursted down. <laughs> Solo still went for it. Um, yeah, you're, a you're able to uh, actually keep the chase going. There's no one that can really run away from you unless they use an escape mechanism. Like Fire Strike or something along those lines. Yeah, yeah I agree. Simple it's... kill mechanic. It's just, it's it's literally just like, do you want to skill your hero in a way that encourages you to like, go after kills when you're a hero that actually, a lot of people think that that's, it's like a mistake to go for kills in this hero even when you can. Because you're putting yourself in harm's way and the best way to play the hero is actually just to like, sit around, he is not, AFK farm jungle. Occasionally you group up with your team to push, but most of the time you're just farming and giving them damage with your aura. Yeah. I don't know about this from Hook, but I've, I've now counted six Forged spirits, which are being killed off by no one. Being able to Crypt Swarm um, Forged Spirits twice and then just physically attack them Dyer's down from there doesn't seem to take much, but it's just that little bit of extra farm keeps kicking into that Death Prophet. So now she's got a bottle, she's got her phase boots up and running. 10 minutes in, Exorcism is back off cooldown. Chrono Spear is available for Mag. So I'm, I'm looking for the tier 1 play towards mid. Like, Drama's yeah, forged still climbing spirits. up, but she's. He's actually finished that Yasha I was talking about. Forge Brits are one of those kind of settles that, like, I, I, there's a lot of summons actually in Dota that people regularly, like, feed more than they should. And there's something about, it's one of those, th it's like kind of like trade swapping. Once you get into the habit of trade swapping, it's like the most obvious thing, you'll always do it. But you need to get into that habit. And it's just, you have to kind of get into the habit of valuing the, the lives of your summons and not just throwing them away. A lot of people kind of just instinctively don't think about that, so I think not the mid lane which Vega we're going to focus on. They're headed down to the bottom lane instead. Uh, because Monkey Business were able to get down in that, that Observer Dyer's before they got fully scouted out by that Dire Ops, uh, they were able to see the trade and go for the mid. Fortification will trigger, but this is just a simple trade for trade. Vega don't have to stop here. They've still got Exorcism available. They can force that tier 2. You look how fast that tier 1 tower dies. Like, Mama's boys are gonna keep trying to trade. That's like it's exa it's exactly the right decision here. I don't think they're in a position to take the fight right now. Vegas they're gonna back. keep. Yeah, because because Vega feel very confident going into a fight, so they're like, if you're not gonna come if you're just gonna trade, then we'll come to you and, and fight you. Well, I actually do Although it looks, on. yeah, but it looks like two of them just wanna rush. Well, the thing is, it's not really try. The sun is gonna scout it out perfectly. So nice presence of mind by Hook. They don't care. Does it, like Vega, like like I just said, Mama's boys don't want to take the fight. So even if they know there's rush, they, they can't do anything about it. Yeah. It's, it's lovely when a draw plan comes together. Not so certain about giving the Aegis the model to a death prophet who's just about to finish up a Yule scepter. But uh, she she expends her ultimate, and then I'd say then she doesn't really give that much more. Uh, I gotta remember Soul Siphon as well as Crypt Swarm does a hell of a lot. Another talent yeah, actually, up after this is T1 for T1. It's actually, I've been talking a lot about how like it's unusual to have Drow and DP together because the Drow doesn't, the aura doesn't benefit the DP that much, but there's something in this which I think is maybe quite sophisticated from Vega, which is that you, when you're against the Drow strat, you're always going to try to focus the Drow, so you're going to go to great lengths to find her at the back of the, the push, go onto her, kill her, and what's really cool about this Vega strat is even if they throw everything at Drow and kill Drow, DP is still going to be destroying them. It's not like... Once the draw dies, suddenly DP doesn't have the damage output. She's still got it because she doesn't depend on the draw that much. So if you look at it that way, it's actually quite clever to, to pick these heroes. You're in a horrible choke point right now, Mag. He's going to have to time walk himself away. Uh, Disrupt is on the other side of the hill, which is what's making this such a weird pincer move. But it was the ancient stack which was being contested at the time. The blink from Bamboo is now revealed as well, as he blinks away from the Poison Touch. But you get a double Chronosphere. No one. Still not triggering the ult. He can now... Okay, he will do so. The Soul Cypher's not going to do enough. Pine Cat will drop as no one. He can't really reach him. The Ice Ball will separate the field. In comes Bambo for a four-man epicenter. The damage, however, is just not enough. They're going to swap him down. Pulling Disruptor into the fight. The Invoker, the only one to survive. As no one basically dealt with two by himself, didn't even have the Agassi model expended. And that's a it's rough very, position for me. It's very well played by no one actually, because of the positioning that he chose to go for in that fight, because he charged forward and didn't come back to fight the Sand King. It wasn't possible for Mama's boys to actually help Bambo, so it doesn't matter if he gets the world's best uh, Epicenter and Zubara strike. Um, He's on his own there. There's no way that his teammates can run through the Death Prophets. Maybe if Bambo was like level 2 ulti with level 4 stun, but he's, he's not actually level, he's level 1 ulti, he's level 3 stun, so he just couldn't get that much down on his own. Coming up for the Invoker. 
There's no Chronosphere available. Uh, he's also got a TP scroll, and they cannot rely on that stun of Mag. So, uh, Hook will be able to TP himself away to safety. And when that Exorcism comes back up again and Chrono's back up, actually, even without that, they can still force down buildings. With 14 minutes in, and the damage output of Vega is through the roof. You actually get now the Dragon Lance over on Pasha. Visibility. Keep this distance even more. I love it. This is... This is such a well-thought-out timed lineup from Vega. It's a... Uh, Dragon Lance is a really good item on draw, actually. You can keep it if you want. If you want, you can change it eventually into Butterfly, BKB, or even into your Sanjus for Sanjus Nyasha. It's just... The, the range is actually very, very nice. We were talking before about how she wants to... It's like a global hero, like, eh, hey, you want to stand far back, give aura. But because she's already got very high base range, if you buy the Dragon Lance as well, there's, there's a lot more value in sort of being at the fight, but you can still be far away even though you're at the fights, and that lets it play that kind of, like, from the outskirts role which he wants to play. Does the Dragonlance actually update the the displayed attack range? Um, it says seven, I think, it yeah. Says our attack range now is 755. Five. Yeah, it, it, it does update it. Okay. So, because our attack range is usually six, 625, I think, or 6... We can actually figure it out, right? One, th yeah, it's usually six twenty-five. So, yeah. not seven five five. Which six twenty-five itself is actually very high range. So thinking about how it works now with also the radius of uh, Mag's ulti, just how far away she can be, but still attacking people inside the Chronosphere. But there's such a huge bubble which is created by Vega. Now it's going to force the issue. A defensive weave, so their armor goes through the roof. You put that Yule Scepter on the Death Prophet, and still walking around with the Aegis Immortal. So no one's happy to tank the initial burst of damage. And now Mag jumps, and he just on the edge gets both Venna as well as the Disruptor. Now Snowball in for a little bit of safety, but then the burst kill from Solo kicks in. They take so much damage that Death Ult, that Death Prophet ulti is still going to work. Until Bambo, he can pick up the two backliners, including the Drow Ranger. Now Vega's in trouble. The Stormball flies forward. Mag and becomes back inside the base. And now Vega, they don't respect enough of the monkey business's high ground defense. They lose their backline. Man's got time walk again in one second time. He'll jump down, looking for the TP out, but they've got stuns available. They'll find the kill. Mag will drop. Vega losing three as they try and force the issue pre-15 minutes into the MB base. Yeah, and I mean, they're, like, without a doubt, much, much stronger. They should be winning a 5v5 fight, but it's exactly as you said. It's, it's the high ground. And this is not something new in Dota 2, right? This is like, high ground has been kind of the talking point of Dota for a year or two now already. Uh, that is where, if you're trying to push, you're most likely to to get turned back. And honestly, I think Vega were ready to take the fight. The Chronosphere was a bit awkward. It was like, I think most of the players would have thought that it's going to be a bad Chrono. It, it turned out to be quite a good one, mm -hmm. but it was so close to being a bad one that I think they weren't ready to like, aha, he hit the Chrono, let's go. And there's, there's a little bit of indecision there. Then they end up swapping in the Invoker. It, it just looks very messy, the execution for Vega. Whereas Mama's Boys, the defending team, when you're defending high ground, it's, it's a lot easier to get your execution right. And they do exactly that and repel the push. It seems such a weird thing as well for Vega to do this. Like, you understand that the Epicenter SK is going to come in from behind. The Snowball from Yaps or Force of Vega to come in closer because they thought they had an opportunity. When that Dazzle Shadow Wave went out, I thought, okay, this fight is over. The damage output into Monkey Business should have been through the roof, combining it up with the Prophet and all the early damage they did previously. But they found themselves underneath the racks. When you're playing such a ranged lineup, like, your your lineup gets more damage when you play from range. So, yeah. why, why then do you find almost all the heroes Pretty much inside. Like the only ones that weren't with the Dazzle and the Drow at the back lines, which is exactly where they should have been. But the SK is always going to reach them. The Tuscar can close the distance. And when PyCat is able to finish, actually, I'm wondering if he does go the Blink Dagger. Um, but if he gets a Blink Dagger up and running, they're always going to close that distance. Yeah, and it's exactly a positioning thing. So Vega ended up too far forward, even though they've got the range. And on the other hand, Mama's boys managed to defend the base without anyone standing right up against DP for like the duration of the fights. And DP is probably the reason that they, even though the fight starts badly, they decide to keep fighting because you have a death prop. It's, it's like peaking. It's really strong. It has its ulti on. Like, why not keep going? But again, it's when the enemy team is defending high ground, it's easier for them to like play around that. And no single hero has to like completely tank the ghosts. They're waiting on bottom lane. 
very exposed here, and Bambo is going to really try and capitalize on it. Blink forward, gets the Burrow Strike. They've still got Solo behind them. In fact, they already swapped Pasha out. Right on the Sentry Ward in case Bambo is hanging around inside that Sandstorm. They put Damn. the swap on the cooldown, but uh, right now Vega, they're fine with that. They're just waiting for Roshan. Yeah, M Mama's boys were basically just checking how many people were there. So they thought Drow's there, maybe covered by Dazzle. They're happy to go on that. As soon as they see the bench, they're like, okay, there's actually a lot of heroes here. Let's get out of here. So that mech from Vega is being built over on Solo. Kind of putting all your all your healing eggs in one basket. But it's allowing no one to go directly into this Octarine after finishing up his Yule Scepter. Well, this is a very clever move from Vega. This is very clever. Actually, Drow's throwing mids, the other three smoking to top, and there's going to probably be a T here. Oh, yeah. Swap back. Disruptor ulti, though. Closing a couple of problems for Vega. They do commit the exorcism of the Death Prophet, so they have to get back in range of Pycap. He's just running away the snowball from Yapsaw. It's going to try and create as much space as possible. And, uh, well, the space was created. He lose his life for it, but it's a lot better that he dies than Pycat dies. Max, oh, Max just... could actually chrono this, but he's got no help. They're too far away, and the damage output of this Faceless Void is nowhere near enough. The Wave of Terror is also short. He'll jump down again, try and slow down this Ven, but Warcry's back off cooldown, so Pycat up. Doesn't start his TP, they gust, but he runs the other way. Again, Mag, trying to close that distance. The shadow, actually the weave is what reveals at his position as he comes underneath the tower, out goes the TP, but it will not be successful. Bambo, he tried to actually force stop him to allow the TP to function, but ends up feeding his own life and now a double kill into that Drow Ranger. And at the same time as Roshan spawns, it couldn't get any worse for him. Something we didn't really talk about yet this game, but it's actually a very good game for time dilation. So that's another thing that justifies the void. Everyone on the team of Mama's Boys has like a lot of uh, craftable spells. So it's quite nice. It means outside of Chrono, he's going to be doing a lot of work. He's going to be slowing people. He's going to be, you know, stopping them from getting those cooldowns up again. But yeah, I, I think the original move from Vega is just very, very clever. Because Drow is not usually seen as a hero that like TPs into a fight and then the fight starts. Um, and that's kind of the, the play they made. The Void had TP but he couldn't actually get there early on, he had to run across. It was just, literally, it was like the three kind of supporty. I mean, well, I guess it was the DP and two supports. Smoking on their own, and you re you see a draw, you don't think that they're going to start a fight with draw TPing in, but actually you're wrong. That's how they start the fights, and I think Vega pulled back basically everything that they threw away with the, the failed high ground. Still can't afford to do the same thing again. Probably another reason why they're waiting for the perfect items. The mech is now completed. You're another, what is that, 1 1k away from having the Octarine up on No One. The Drow Ranger converted her Dragon Lance into the PKB part uh, and now can go for the Butterfly. The, the blink on, on Void, I think, is the really big item, actually, because we're not going to see indecision about. You know, if Mag says, guys, I'm going to chrono, I think the team's going to be much more confident and go in because they expect a very good chrono once there's a blink dagger. TPing down the bottom lane. They see Pycat. Mag? Yeah, he's, he's gonna say it's worth the committal of the level 2 Chronosphere. Cat doesn't take as much damage as you'd think because he's got his Warcry up, but uh, the Shadow Wave was all. Actually, did that Warcry disappear halfway through it, I think? By the way, Shadow Wave also affected them. And now Pycat's down for 50 seconds. Exorcism off cooldown. You don't have your Chronosphere, however. There's no buyback for this event. Mama's boys won a split push, which is like the most value they've gotten all game, except for in that one fight where they defended high ground. Most of the value they've gotten is by split pushing, and they've been making very good decisions about when to split push. And actually, this puts... Yeah, that's true, but it, I mean, they don't have another choice, and it actually puts a lot of pressure on Vega, because Vega have to get this done now. They also are uh, fighting a little earlier. The creep wave hasn't arrived yet. They have more than enough damage to burn through it. But you've just lost your tier 2 tower in mid. Your tier 3 tower on the top lane is almost down. You claim the bottom racks. Okay, you don't lose your tier 3 tower on top. If they lost that, then I'd be a little bit more questionable about if Monkey Business could have fought back. Um, solo? Yeah, they're leaving it for dead. You can shallow grave and mech and just waste their time. He doesn't have a TP scroll. So he just decided, decided to stand his ground and fight. He'll die. Uh, just having a little fun. 
Doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I think he probably could have gotten out, but at the same time, if you think there's any risk of being caught, it's actually better to deliberately sacrifice an unimportant hero than take the risk that they, they get an important one. So sometimes those kind of decisions can be strategic. But actually, the, the Veil pickup on Bambo is, is, is... If there is a game-changing item in this game, it's that. It's it's 100% definitely that. And if we see... Because I, I thought it was really good that Mama's Boys could push. There was no way they were going to defend there, especially not without the Sven. But actually, the next time Vega push, I think Mama's Boys are just going to fight them. And if there's a good Veil, if there's a good Epicenter and stun... It's actually... It's definitely a fight Mama's Boys can win. Ron's ready to fight apart from the Invoker, but he does have those BTs on him. Can join the engagement as uh, Bambo puts himself up on top of a hillside. They see Seema. He's gonna actually Glimmer Cape himself up. The Sentry Ward reveals he, he moved north. Bambo is just hiding in the tree line. The Sigil is actually chasing that Vengeful Spirit. Alright, they cancel the TP, but no, no committal from either team. And actually, a target's done for Vega. It's like, yeah, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Like, almost everyone from Vega, they're actually gonna smoke themselves up just outside the range. Bambo's also smoked. He's, he's, he, he knows that this, this game is on him right now. Broke. Mag got close enough to him. And they know he's there now. That's what they have to avoid. They have to avoid a huge play from Bambo. That's the only thing Vega really needs to be thinking about. And they're, they're disabling his blink as much as they can. Stormbolt's able to be dodged by the Yule Scepter. They're looking for that running out. Can't just, he's trying to get them to initiate on him. Because he's the Aegis the Immortal character. It doesn't matter if he dies, he'll respawn in just a moment's time. No one's always gonna wear off, but a big ulti and shallow grave kicks in. Four heroes from Mag. Now Bambo comes in with the epicenter. He's looking for the kill over on Seema, but they've got so much armor, so much life. The heal is there. The disruptor Ollie though catching up Mag as well as the death prophet. You have to use them to rub. And get a spot away to save him with a big silence in return. Pasha with a gust bag finally buys himself some space here. Looking for the damage with the double buyback kicking in here from Monk Business. They're looking to desperately scramble some level of defense here. The Pasha's gonna go to work on Yapsaw. The silence is holding for now. And Yapsaw, while well, the silence finally wears off, Pasha has to back up. They still have Shallow Grave available. The Sun Strike, however, he wasn't looking for that one. Yapsaw survives on 14 HP. As Vega now have to disengage, no one's been draw brought back in, so maybe they can't disengage. They have to try and protect that Death Prophet, who starts a Soul Siphon already. The Ice Wall makes it difficult for Soul to escape out of here. There's no one, do they just leave him? Yeah. They're going to actually leave Seymour or Solo. One last Shallow Grave. Seymour's done a fair chunk of damage here, however, but he's still going to end up dying. The Soul is also going to end up dying. Hunger around a little bit too long and air glimpsed back and killed off. And what did really, what did Vega achieve from that? Like you forced two buybacks. Both the support spot back, I think. But uh, he didn't take the racks. Yeah, they got the tower. They forced two support buybacks. It's, it's still actually, I think I agree with you. It's still mostly good for Mama's boys for the position, and I think that's mostly on the fact that uh, Vega stayed too long. Their DP ulti ran out, and as it was like, I think one or two seconds before it ran out, that's when Pycat initiated. Because you can know, you can just look at the DP status and see how long it is till Ulti's gonna run out. And that's it's it's exactly what I was saying at the start of the draft. DP is not dealing lots of damage because of draw or DP is dealing a lot of damage because of her Ulti to some extent because of her other spells. Mm -hmm. But if she doesn't have her Ulti up, then all of a sudden a lot of the value on their team is is mitigated, and Mama's boys can actually win a fight. And on top of that, Pac uh, Bambo did get like a, a very nice jump eventually. He burned the Aegis the Immortal and forced uh, Vegas supports to scramble. We'll just kind of split the fight into two different pieces. Currently looking at the biggest beneficiary from these fights, and that's Hook. Well, he's got 4.8k gold over on this Invoker at the moment. I'm interested to see what his next major item is. If it's going to be something like a BKB, so he can stand in the fight. I don't know if, if that's even going to be enough, because a lot of the damage coming out from Vega is physical. So do you then try and go for Disable? Do you try and go for something else? What's the play for the Evoker? I don't know, it's it's actually a tough one. I, I think he might get a Hex. Otherwise he might want to buy like a big Aura, like an AC or Shivas or something. What if he got something like a Scardi? Like really good stats and at least turns him into more of a, like a damager during the fight. It's, I mean, that's also, yeah, it's, it's also possible. I, I feel like the the problem is that the impact of this guy is too, like, incremental. Although, I say it's that, and he's just bored 
so the Octarine, probably, right? I don't know, he's thinking about a Bloodstone, but... Yeah, that's, that, that doesn't seem like an Invoker item it to me. It doesn't Bloods seem like an Invoker item either. Yeah, Octarine looks like it's the thing. Alright, so, I mean, that's kind of like the the next best thing after Aghanims if you want to just, like, get lots of spells. It's gonna be life-stealing from the num all the number of things that he costs. But I worry for, I mean, Mama's Boys, that hold was all about DP not having ulti, and so I feel like the next fight they get into, they might have to actually deal with the DP ulti, otherwise they just lose Raxes. Vega pushed down that lane. Like, you you actually have to confront the DP ulti. The smoke gank is perfect. Hook walks back into it, Mag. He has a two-man Chronosphere. He lost the vision, however, I think, because it was nighttime, and they've walked out of range of the Observer Ward. Yeah, the nighttime saved him. If it was daytime, he gets a double Chrono and, like, very easy kills. Yeah. Been so huge, like just after Invoker spent a huge chunk of his money, but they wouldn't have taken away his buyback. But if you got that kill and then you're able to force the buyback, that's probably worth even more because you cripple the biggest hero on Monkey on uh, Mama's Boys. I got, I, I keep looking at their name and thinking Monkey Business. <laughs> yeah, the same thing happens to me actually. It's like MB being Monkey Business and I have to like make an efforts to. You look at their picture each time, then remember it says, I love mom. Yeah, mama's boys. I, I actually tried searching for, for quirky gifts for mama's boys. They, there, there was a lot of... I found the cleanest one I possibly could to tweet out for tonight. Well, that's... That's that's cool. It's I'm, I, I am impressed that you tried. <laughs> um, My thing. Now, it's time for uh, mama's boys to try. Attack. Ambo comes in from behind, gets the Burrow Strike over from Solo, four staffs away, keeps himself out of this fight, but then the Chrono catches Flycat as well as Hook, that entire DP ulti, I want to watch what happens to Hook right now, even though the Snowball is delaying up a lot more of the fight, Hook is going to run north away from the rest of his team as the Suns just keep going out, Pasha pumping damage and slow into that Sven, so he just can't keep fighting, now Flycat turns for the stun, but he just can't inflict enough damage anymore, the Invoker is getting the hell out of here, and so is the rest of Vega. Buyback is available for Pycat. And uh, Vega needs to be careful. DP ulti is going to run out. So they, they can force Pycat buyback, but if they get caught, they might actually get a bunch of deaths as well. Oh, Bambo is looking for He's got Epicenter as well as Veil ready. You're right, I think this is actually Vega's very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. Like, they, they, they want the Sven to buy back, but I think they need to realize that if he does buy back, it's going to be because they're caught out. And... Just go for Roshan. He's up now. Yeah, that, that fight, by the way, like, it was almost very good for Mama's boys. The Void and the Avenger were both meant to die at the start of the fights. I don't know if you picked that up, but faced this Void, crossed Time Walk, and healed like 800 HP. That's, he like, was tanking all this huge nuke damage from Invoker spells, and he Time Walk from red HP back to pretty much full. Occasionally you see that happening, it's like basically just a Weaver ulti, and then people like, kind of just, I don't know, face palm at the, at the spell. So Aegis the Immortal is now in the hands of the Death Prophet. Again, I kind of question a little bit why the Aegis is kind of better on the draw who can just get bursted down. But yeah, the Death Prophet is a lot more difficult to do that on. But they give her the Aegis anyway, so it looks like no one's going to become that tank. The Octarine is now finished from Hook, but let's check out buyback status. SK Invoker and Sven, so even after purchasing that item, they've still got their buybacks. And they've almost waited at the full six minutes. It's their previous yeah. push. Oh, they Bambo's found trying to set up. They found Bambo on the side. Commit Chrono for it. It's an Aghanim's Chrono, so hey, why not? He has to buy back. He does. They, they, can't, they can't defend without him. There's no way. Vega is still going to push up. We've only got another three seconds left. In comes the Bambo TP. The all set is keeping Death Prophet in position, but Seema, he just knows. The Observable is already down. They understand exactly where Bambo is. And now, they just keep beating into Pycat once again. No one dodges the stun with his BKB trigger. Allows him to walk through the wall as well. But that DP ulti now, two hours of the way through the duration. There's still a very big creep wave here, and they're gonna glimpse Pasha back. He doesn't BKB to dodge the glimpse though. In fact, he just BKBs after he gets glimpsed back in again. But that exorcism has run out, the BKBs are gone. Bambo is oh, looking a big for that forest strike. He's gonna go into the tree line, almost a YOLO kind of style. Four stop away from the Soul Siphon as well as the Silence of No One. Radiant's Vega, they can't find him at all. 
Thomas boys have gone three different ways, but Vampire oh, again. Man. Oh, they couldn't afford to have this happen. At least they have the big damage dealing ultimate that's killing him off as the Invoker tries to burn through the VS, but it's not going to happen. They just swap Yapsor back in. This could be the game right now where you lose your big heroes until that whole team from Disruptor. Zima, he's going to live, get out of the... Okay, he's going to stay in the storm, but they survive anyway. I like the little kind of uh, mini fight between the two offlaners this game. Where, I mean, that's what, like, Void got Axe and then catches Sam King with Chrono. He dies, he buys back. Void catches him again with another Chrono in like a minute later. And that's kind of like, I mean, obviously they go ahead and close to closing out the game. But the fact that Mag caught uh, Bambo twice in a row is is kind of like the the final straw that, that breaks the camel's back. And I mean, they're going to pause because they want to fix their lag. But I think even without Exorcism here, yeah, these mid Raxes die. And the Exorcism is coming back very soon. So Vega might just stay and go for a third side. This is Nocturne, so Radiance used to cool down anyway. And that physical damage Radiance is too much. There's no tier 2 tower on the top lane to protect the top racks either. Pasha's Radiance still walking around with cheese and no one's still got the Aegis the Immortal. So there's no reason why they can't just force in the Megas. This game, it's... I, I, I'm sorry for the mama's voice, but uh... This is, this is over. Max got Chrono back off cooldown. All he's going to see Pycat and actually catches Hook instead. So Pycat can try and look to as much damage as he wants to. He's getting some good cleave damage out. Seema, well, he's still visible, but now they just turn over to Pycat. And he is dead. Boka will buy back. Pasha just triggers his cheese, so he just survives through it. Bambo throws the ulti up, but he's only really hitting BKB targets. And there it is. Finally, the TG call comes out. Vega will take game number one with a well-executed draw strat. Maybe a little bit too eager on the bottom lane, but overall, this game, it never really felt like it got out of their control. Yeah, and this is, I mean, I sort of feel like a matchup between these two teams is Vega's expected to be the stronger team, expected to outclass Mama's Boys, and Mama's Boys, I think, need to outthink Vega, and I don't think they really did it this game. It didn't, didn't impress me, didn't really convince me. I, I definitely still think they're capable of it, but... Yeah, for this game one, it's it's just one-way traffic, and it's, 